Okay, look, yeah. How many of you are affected, like, a lot? How many of you still have power out? Power is still out, still out, still, okay, you guys are okay. You know, I feel like uh, I was driving through the neighborhood uh, near where I live, and uh, we have a lot of old houses and a lot of, a lot of big trees, and uh, it really struck me uh, about uh, what happened over the past uh, couple days, and it really, I think, was, a, uh, it was an admonishment for me, and I think it should be for all of us. You know, like a wind, when a wind like that sweeps through, what happens, what will happen if you are not deeply rooted is you'll get blown off. You know, I saw these tr- majestic trees, you know, like 40, 50 footers, you know, where, where I live. And, and these things got uprooted, just completely came out. And you know, the line covering the road, um, just the other day, Josh uh, texted a picture of, of a car where a, a tree landed. Even uh, Melvin, when he was driving into this place, almost got hit by a tree. But I think that's a, it's a message for us. And it's, it's always a good thing for us to check. How deeply are you rooted in Christ Jesus? Because the winds will come. The winds will come. And sometimes it's a wind that the Lord will allow. And I think it's to help us to say, how deep are we? And do we need to get deeper? That's the first thing I would submit to you before we get into our passages today. Second thing is, how many of you tuned into the live stream this past Wednesday? I did. How many others? How many of you were in attendance? Okay, good. So we got, I really want to encourage you. um, You can find the live stream of the Wednesday night Bible study um, on our website. Uh, at wholeword.net, if you go in, there's a section, I think it's called services or messages, to be very exact. You click on that, and then it'll take you to where the live streams are. You won't get charged for clicking anything, so just click a bunch of stuff, and, you know, if you don't find it the first time, you know, you'll eventually get there. But I really want to, to highlight that, and for those who are uh, watching us right now, I, I hope you understand the kind of treasure that we have in Pastor Pitts. He, he's a treasure, really. He's, he blows my mind. And uh, I feel inadequate being up here because he's not, you know. But uh, he's a treasure. And uh, he is really equipping you. It's almost, almost like you're in seminary. Uh, if you, you want to go as deep as you want, I think he can take you there. But it's, it's a real... If you've ever wanted to get into the scriptures, get into God's word, um, this is a great opportunity. This is going to probably take a year, maybe two years to go through the entire Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, usually in seminaries, you know, they'll, you, you'll have a semester to go through, uh, you know, semester one, two, or three. You do OT one, two, and three, and you do the New Testament. This is something like that, where we were going to go really deep into the Scripture. So I want to really encourage you. Of course, it's better to be there in person, right? I think we can all agree that on that. But if you can't, uh, through the uh, amazing uh, wonder of the technology that we have, uh, you're able to log in on the website. Uh, but let's give a hand. Uh, where's, is Bill here today? Bill, Bill's here, Peter, uh, just get, give them a hand. It was, uh, it, it was, it was, really, I logged in, Asuna and I logged in on Wednesday, probably a little bit later than we should, and it was like, I couldn't hear anything, and it was like, how many of you had that experience? And then they just, they fixed it, like, it was really right away, they fixed it. So, so thank you, thank you guys for uh, doing that work. Finally, you know, we had, uh, yesterday we had the memorial service for Roy. And, uh, you know, I think <clears throat> the question that came into my mind, um, which I will pose to you as well, is, is what, what kind of legacy are you going to li- leave in, with your life? You know, every one of us, we don't know when God's going to call us home. We don't know. Our life 
In the book of James, it says our life is like a vapor. You know, one, and one moment it's there, and in another moment it's not. And the question, I think, for every one of us to confront and to answer is, where is your life right now? What legacy will you leave when God calls you home? You know, I read a book uh, about Borden of Yale, and uh, it was a book that was assigned to me by my missions leader, and uh, I didn't know who he was, and I'm just like, oh, why can't I read about Hudson Taylor, or how come I can't read about some other pers famous person that I know? Anyway, I grew to really love this, uh, this aspiring missionary, Borden of Yale. He came from a lot of money, um, and his heart was to reach, uh, to reach China and to get to China. By the world standards, he was a failure. He never made it. He got sick on the way en route to China, and in Egypt he died. But he, one of the things that he said was something that really inspired uh, Billy Graham. I'm going to go into a little bit of his life today. But one thing that he said, and, and again, around that question of what will your legacy be, is this is the thing that he said. He said, no reserves, no regrets. And that's how he lived his life. And I want to encourage you today to have no reserves and no regrets as you pursue after and follow God. I believe that's the only way we can have any legacy, anything that matters that will be passed on to the next generation. So if you have your Bible, uh, please turn with me. We're going to have the scriptures up there. Uh, I want to talk to us this morning about the simplicity and the power of the gospel of Jesus. I'm just going to read through all these passages, and then we'll get right into um, the preaching today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 22 through 25. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Matthew eleven twenty five 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. First, for the Jew first. And also for the Greek. I memorized that verse in the NIV, so I'm always going there, but reading this in another version here. In John 12, 32. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Let's just pray real quick. Lord, we just feel your invitation even now. Your invitation to the simple gospel. Lord, 
what may seem like foolishness and simplicity to the one who seeks wisdom and weakness and insufficiency for the one who seeks power. Reveal the glories of your simple gospel to us. Reveal the power that you have placed in the message of your son and what he has come to do and what he came to do, what he accomplished and what he will do. Lord, speak to us. Give clarity, even in our spirit right now. Even in me and even in all of us that hear, give clarity. Align our hearts to yours. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you weren't, if you don't live under a rock or in a cave, if you didn't dig a hole and throw away all your devices and turn off your TV, you would know that the Reverend Billy Graham died on February 21st, uh, a couple weeks ago. You know, his life spanned 100 years. He died at the age of 99, but he was born in 1918. And he died in 2018, 100 years, 100 years of life. And there's a lot of different prophetic significances I'm not really going to go into, but he was a man used by God. We can all agree. We can all agree. God used him in a powerful, powerful way, unmatched in some sense, um, in, in, very, in, a very, in very many ways that we can think of. He wasn't the most eloquent man. We didn't know him because of his eloquence, and we didn't know him because he was super insightful. I've read many of his books. Um, they're, they're blessings. They're really blessings. But I wouldn't put them in the category of some of the other books that I've read that I go, wow. That was amazing. This guy is so, this guy or gal is so whatever. Put whatever adjective you want. Smart, insightful, anointed. You know, all, come on. We're Christians. We have all these special, you know, adjectives that we like to use. Billy Graham was not, you would not put his writings or even what he, how he spoke or what he spoke. You wouldn't really put that, that, in, that in those categories. But if you compare the output, if you would compare the productivity between all these others who are super insightful and who blow your mind, and what are some of the things that younger, younger ones, I got wrecked, you know, or, you know, what are, you know, what, you know, all these different ways we describe how wonderful something is. You put them all on one side and you put the Reverend Graham on this side and you compare their productivity, I would submit to you, Billy Graham, the scales would be complete. The, the scales would fall so much, so fast on Billy Graham's side that all these guys would be thrown out, you know. <laughs> They'd be flipped, you know, and thrown into, you know, wherever. That's not to say that we don't need eloquence or great insight, or skillful articulation. We need those things. But I think as we look at Billy Graham's life, I think it highlights something else. The power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the power was the message itself. It wasn't all the dressing around it. It wasn't even the, you know, Billy Graham didn't walk in a miracle ministry. Not like some of the others that we know. He didn't walk in that. He preached a simple gospel. And millions of people made decisions for Jesus. Hundreds of millions, maybe even billions, were reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
So what is the gospel? What's the gospel? The word in, in Greek, I'm probably going to butcher the word in Greek. Some of you that are Greek scholars are going to be like, mm, he doesn't know his Greek. But it's euangelion. What does that sound like? Evangelism. I know. So, hey, see, I probably said it, you know, in such a way that you guys didn't get it. But it means good news. It's the root word for, for where we get evangelism. It's good news. It's good news. And above all, the gospel, it's a love story. It's a story that tells us that we're loved, that God loves us, that God loves us and would go to every length, every effort to redeem us and to bring us back to himself. The gospel message centers around one person. It's Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, who lived as a carpenter for the first 30 years of his life and entered into his ministry. His life, his ministry, and his death and his resurrection are the center point of the gospel, of the good news. The good news that you and I have, the only thing that preserves us and the only winsome thing that really we really have. We may have miracles. We may have charismatic ways to convey information, to win a heart. But without Jesus, it means nothing. The story of the gospel is that you are loved. God loves you. Sometimes we forget that, you know. We're so busy living life. And sometimes we're even busy doing church, you know. Many of us who are in ministry, you know, sometimes you're doing church. You're doing the activity. And we forget this truth, that God loves you. He loves you. And he went to every and the fullest length that he could. God couldn't give more than what he gave. He gave his son, his only begotten son, to redeem us and to save us from sin and death. What's the gospel? How can we how can we reiterate and, and restate the gospel? The gospel of Jesus Christ is this. Some of this, you know, how many of you know the Apostles' Creed? That's, that's a statement of the gospel, okay? But let's just, just walk through this with me. And let it sink in as, as we go through this together. The gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus Christ is this, that God in love created you and I to walk with him and enjoy him forever. This is the Garden of Eden. This is what we're created to do. We're created to have unbroken fellowship, walking with him in the garden, hearing his voice, taking his hand, walking wherever he wants to walk. But we, through Adam, turned away from God in rebellion. We sinned against him. He said, don't eat of that, that tree. Don't take that fruit. And what did we do through Adam? We took that fruit. We said, I know better. You may cast it in many different ways, but ultimately, it's a rebellion. It's, you don't know better, I know better, and I'm going to eat of that tree. What resulted from that sin is separation from God forever. Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden. It's an eternal death. God is life. He's love, but he's life. And to the extent that we have life, it's to the extent that we're close to him. 
we're eternally separated from God. But even at that point, even at the point of the fall in Genesis chapter 3, God already launches the plan of redemption and salvation. He says to the serpent, you will, you will strike his heel, but he will, he, will, he will crush your head. From the very beginning, even from the moment that we turned away, God launches his redemptive plan. This plan of redemption culminates in the sending of his only son, Jesus Christ, to the earth. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin. He lived a perfect and sinless life. He did not sin. He fulfilled every requirement in the law. But when the time came, he was condemned unjustly on false charges by his very own people, the people of Israel. And he died a cruel death on a Roman cross and was buried. After three days, God raised him from the dead and he ascended to be seated at the right hand of God. And he will come again to judge all of humanity, both living and dead. That's the gospel. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. God loves us. We turned away. He continues to reach out. But all along, he knows he has to send his son. He has to go himself. The prophets, the law, none of these things are enough to bring the heart of the people of God. Why? Ezekiel and the book of Ezekiel tells us because we have a heart of stone. We had to have that heart replaced with a heart of flesh. How do you respond to the gospel? You respond by first believing that you believe these things. You know, sometimes you can say things and not believe them. But you have to believe. Faith is the key. You have to repent. You have to turn away from where you've been and what you've been doing and how you've been living and the state of your heart. You have to repent. And then you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And when you do, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Interestingly, in the Acts account, you know, uh, Peter preaches his first sermon and then you know, people are cut to the heart, it says. And they go, well, what shall we do? What shall we do? And Peter gives these steps. He says, basically, believe, repent, and be baptized. And then what? The what is you will receive the Holy Spirit. And interestingly, it doesn't mention, and you will be saved. You know, we, we, we jump to that conclusion because that is what, the, whole, the Holy Spirit is the seal of our salvation. Him entering us and filling us is the mark of our salvation. But what it, tells, what it tells us that happens is we get filled with the Holy Spirit. We receive the Spirit. I just thought that was an interesting thing. If you've ever heard David Ruhlman, he'll always point that out to you, that, uh, that there isn't the mention of the word save. Let's go back to Billy Graham, his life, his death, and his significance. So Billy Graham believed this message. He preached this message. You know, I got saved when I was little, and, uh, um, you know, I grew up in the day when Billy Graham was still doing crusades. They're televised. You know, they were kind of a thing, you know, like, oh, you know, there's a Billy Graham crusade on, and, you know, let's watch it, or we can watch it. And I have to, 
I have to be honest with you, even then, and maybe I'm, you know, I'm probably too... I'm probably too smart for my own good, or I'm too stupid for my own good, whatever, you know, however that is. I I have have to be honest with you. I wasn't that impressed, you know, with the message, because, you know, maybe I'd been churched long enough, and I I had been kind of, I want to hear, I want to hear a good message, right? How many of you, raise your hands, all of you want to hear a good message, okay? None of you are, you know, exceptional in that regard. I do too. But it can't be denied, the man's impact. Let me read you some of, uh, some of the facts. And some of these facts might be a little bit uh, conservative. Um, Billy Graham preached the gospel in person in over 185 countries. 185 countries, okay? Now, it's mind-blowing. I'm trying to get my invitation to my first country outside the U.S., right? It's not easy to get an invitation. You, 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 get, you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes these are nations saying, we want you to come, right? 185 countries invite the Reverend Billy Graham. Some of these countries, as far as I'm concerned, not a Christian nation, but they're inviting this man to come. In through his preaching and through the crusade ministry, it's estimated 210 million people were preached to. I'm talking about preached to, okay? In person, okay? 210 million people. Now, out of that, this is probably conservative because this is what the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association has recorded. But out of all that, 2.3 2.3 million decisions for Jesus were recorded during that time. 2.3 million. That's like, it's like half of the population of Washington, D.C. You know, the, not just D.C., it's, but, you know, the Nova, you know, this whole monstrosity called uh, the Washington, D.C. area. I love this area. Don't, don't take that the wrong way. Through a combination of his crusades, his radio, his television, uh, crusades, and ministry, it's estimated that he reached 2.2 billion people. 2.2 billion people, okay? 2.2 billion people heard the same message that I did about Jesus. Billy Graham was, a, as you know, of course, counselor to presidents and world leaders. How many of you tuned in to to his, uh, his funeral or also his lying in state at the Capitol. How many of you t- tuned in? You can still find it. You can still, I-, I believe, regardless of what you believe about President Trump, President Trump gave, gave an excellent, excellent um, s- speech or eulogy or whatever you would call that. Um, excellent, excellent. And, and presented the gospel. Um, the, another one, if you've, if you've heard Kathy Lee Gifford um, when given the opportunity to remember Billy Graham, she basically, to all the viewers on the Today Show, basically preached the gospel. You know, we're living in a day when the gospel of Jesus is going forth in ways that we had never, ever heard or thought of. But he did all of that with the same message. Billy Graham was a one-trick pony. He didn't have other stuff in his arsenal, you know? I mean, let, let's be fair. I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. He was a charismatic man. You know, people flocked to him. But he made his message the very same as some of the verses that we read. The Apostle Paul says the same thing. I'm going to preach Christ crucified. That's what I'm going to preach. That's going to be the message of my life. He didn't have a miracle ministry. I'm not saying that we shouldn't seek to see signs and wonders. I believe that's the full menu of the people of God. is the proclamation of the gospel and the demonstration of the kingdom by signs and wonders. 
I believe we, we contend for that. But, but Billy Graham didn't even walk in that. The question for us today, as I, as I close, do you believe in this message? I have to confront it myself. I need to be refreshed in it myself. I don't know about you, but I'm probably more like a Greek. Maybe I'm a Greek and a Jew, the way that the Apostle uh, Paul describes it. I seek both power and wisdom. We want our minds tickled. We like the intriguing argument. We like the presentation that stimulates our brain. But do you believe in the simple gospel? Do you believe in the message that I just, I just read over to you? For some of you, it may have gotten a little bit old hat. And if it is old hat, maybe it's time to revisit what it means to be saved. What reason, wherefore, is the reason for your joy? Maybe you're not in living in joy. Maybe you're not connecting to this Jesus. That's something you, I want you to search out. But the central question for us that I want to pose to all of us today is, do you believe this message? Do you believe that this message is, as Paul says in Romans 1.16, that this message is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Is it still changing your life? It should. It should. It's two things that I want us to, to consider as an application of the message today. The first thing, and Peter, if you could put the, the other passages up. The first thing is that we must believe. We have to believe. We have to believe, like Dr. Graham did, that this simple message can change nations. Again, he's a one-trick pony, but he believed it. And look at what God did through a person, through a man or a woman who believed that Jesus alone is the salvation of the nations. James 5.17, it says, and I believe this is in the New King James, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. In the NIV, it says, Elijah was a man just like us. Just like us. We look at Elijah, we look at the fire coming down, and we look at the miracles that he did, and we go, surely, surely he is different than me. Surely he can do things I cannot do. But the scripture says different. He's a man just like us. And because he believed that what God told him to say, and when he said it, when he prayed it, what God told him to pray, the heavens were shut for three and a half years. Do you believe? Do you believe in your God? Amen. Amen. If God tells you to pray a drought for three and a half years, you pray that prayer. God will do it. Moses did the same thing. Although Moses, it's a little bit trickier for Moses. God said, go and, go and tell Pharaoh these things. And he's like, Lord, I'm not, I'm not good at this. Can you, but my brother. So then finally the Lord relents, lets him bring his brother Aaron, who is the chatterbox, I suppose, of the family. But Moses and Aaron, they spoke 
The speaking, the very speaking of it was an exercise of their faith. They speak these judgments on Egypt. And lo and behold, what happens? They happen. I want you to understand that. There is a tie between our faith, our obedience, what we say, what we agree with God about. So Elijah and Moses both speak out what God tells them. They believe. They believe God. So the first thing is, we must believe. Secondly, but believing is not enough. When it comes to the gospel, just like what, what we're just saying about Elijah and Moses, Elijah and Moses may have been, had the greatest revelation from God, you know, like, you know, throne room encounters, you know what I mean? I'm playing a little bit to our, you know, a charismatic jargon, you know, we have, we have a lot of different ways to describe things. They may have, have had throne room encounters, but I guarantee you that the things that are recorded in the scripture would not have happened if they did not speak. If Elijah did not speak, if he did not pray it, and he did not speak to the kings of his day, and the same thing for Moses, the plagues would not have happened through his hand if he did not speak it. Believing is not enough. We have to proclaim this gospel. Romans 10, 13 through 17. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's stand together. We're going to pray and close. I'm just going to, Mina's just going to play a little bit. We're just going to take a, a, just a couple moments just to pray. We're going to pray for two things. And the first thing that I want us to pray, so with your eyes closed, let's just first ask the Lord, Lord, would you stir up fresh faith in my heart? Let's just do that. Just go ahead and let's just pray that. Let's just ask for fresh faith right now. Fresh faith in the centrality of Jesus in the simplicity of who Jesus is. Just begin to ask him. Yes, we will go after signs and wonders. Yes, we will go after all the things that are in the scripture. But it all hinges on the chief cornerstone, on Jesus, the chief cornerstone, on which all the other stones of this living temple, of which all of us are living stones, are built upon. Jesus is our cornerstone. Let's just pray. Just ask the Lord. God, give me fresh faith. Give me fresh faith. Renew my faith. Renew my faith in what you have done. Renew my faith. Some of you may be thinking that this message is irrelevant in this postmodern, post Christian age. And I say, no, it is not irrelevant. This is the message that saves. This is the message through which the nations will be saved. So ask for fresh faith. Ask for fresh faith. Secondly, let's pray. Let's pray for the speaking part, the proclaiming part. Let's ask the Lord for courage. If you're lacking courage, if you feel like there are people that you that you know the Lord wants you to talk to, but you just haven't had the courage, 
We bind fear in the name of Jesus. Some of you feel like you're lacking the wisdom or the eloquence. And I'm telling you right now, it's not about wisdom or eloquence. It's about preaching, demonstrating, being steeped in the life that Jesus gives us. And maybe some of you, you need to get re-steeped. You need to find your joy, the joy of your salvation again. But the Lord will give you wisdom. The Lord will give you courage. Finally, for some of you that you feel like you don't have the open doors, you don't want to break the door down. You don't want to go ahead of God. So then let's ask for opportunities. Sometimes we, we say that, but we, but we don't want to go ahead of God, but we don't ask Him. You know, we don't ask. And so it's kind of, you know, is it the chicken or the egg first type of thing? Um, and you'll never move when the Lord wants you to move. And so let's just begin to ask, Lord, let me see the opportunities. Give me the opportunities. Open the doors that I might proclaim. You know, you are the salt and light of the earth. We're the salt and light. We preserve the earth by our presence but also by our preaching and our proclamation. You don't have to preach a message on a Sunday. You can preach so loud with your friendship, with your life, and by the sharing of your testimony. So let's just pray that. Pray pray for that proclaiming of the gospel, the simple gospel of Jesus. It saves. It will save. It is a timeless message, and it's the message that God said his power is on this message. Don't seek signs and wonders if you don't seek the simple gospel. Don't seek the ministry of angels if you don't seek to preach the gospel. you that are like I'm just trying to get my head above water you know I'm just trying to survive and I just want you to know that the Lord you know, he's our great high priest and he sympathizes with us and uh, I want you to know he's called you to more than just staying afloat and uh, so I just I decree that breakthrough in the name of Jesus. He freed you so that you could be free, not so that you could constantly tread water and and, uh, always under the danger of being sucked in. I believe we have some uh, teams that are going to be up here for ministry if you want want prayer, so I'm going to have them come up. I'm just going to pray a prayer to close, and then you'll be dismissed. Lord, we just come before you. We just ask you for those two things here in this place. That you will stir up fresh faith in you and in the message of the simple gospel. That you love us and that you go to every length to save fallen man. Many of us have lost patience. But Lord, you're a long-suffering God. Teach us to be patient. Teach us to believe who you believe in. And Lord, help us to speak. I feel like there's a lot of Moseses in the room. We're like, I, I stutter. I'm not good at talking. I'm not. But you have put this treasure in these jars of clay. You have put this life-giving message in every one of us. And it's meant to spread like wildfire. It's meant to spread like a contagious disease. And so let it be spread. Lord, right now, there even those who feel like they're over the hill or people that feel like they don't know anything and everyone in between. Let your gospel, the simple message that you love us, that you sent Jesus to save us from our sins, that 
message would go forth. Amen. Come up for prayer. If you, if you have a need for prayer, come on up. There's healing in this house. There's revelation 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 in this house.